Okay. Hey, everybody. Welcome this Friday afternoon. Uh, if any of you saw the promo, what I love, we were just talking about before we came on live, and we had so many of you be like, Dr. Jill's, <laughs> because it's funny. Um, it's interesting. Uh, both of us have a platform around complex chronic disease and mold, especially. And of course, Dr. Jill, my friend, Dr. Jill has written a book. And so lots of synergies. And the other thing we were talking about, and I hope you guys feel this, with me and with interviews and definitely today, I love to collaborate and um, I love learning from my colleagues. I feel like we all can teach each other something. And especially in this realm, there's so many camps and different thoughts of mold and mold related illness. And we were just talking about how important it is for us to continue to learn from one another. And again, I just come with a very open heart because I know that I don't have all the answers, but as we continue to collaborate, we can bring more and more good information to you guys who are listening out there, whether you're professional professional or patients or um, friends or family of someone who's sick. It's so important. And the other thing we were talking about that we'll get into today is when you're in clinical practice, what you have all the time is these patients that are in front of you that are with a complex chronic disease, like mold related illness or Lyme disease or pan and pandas, which we'll talk about today. And you come to a crossroads where you don't have the answer. And again, in conjunction with the patient, if you have a good knowledge base and information, sometimes we try things that are new and sometimes we find they work or they don't work. And as long as there's safety, there's there's this idea of not only collaboration, but really trying to think outside the box to bring clinical solutions to you all. And then, and, and I feel like my job is some of the clinical investigation and testing. And then there's researchers that are far better than me that can take that data and try to prove it out. Uh, but hopefully, Today, you'll hear some of the cutting edge stuff that we're doing and trying and what's working and what's not working. Um, just a little background, many of you have been here before, but if you haven't, you can find all of my blogs information on my website, just jillcarnahan.com. Um, you can find products at drjillhealth.com. And um, I will put links to Dr. Krista's site, her book, her um, other website. So you'll see all those below uh, the interview today. So don't worry if you miss something, the links will be wherever you find this interview, we will have those linked up as well. And I'll try to, as I do, I usually go back after the interview and if there's products we mentioned, or if there's anything like a third party website or resource, I try to put those all in so that don't worry if you miss it, I will do my best to link up on those. Um, so welcome, Dr. Jill Krista. It is absolutely a delight to have you here. Thank you so much. A delight to be here. I cannot wait to have this conversation. Me too. And I'll just introduce you briefly. Um, you've got um, lots more credentials, but I'm going to do a brief introduction. Dr. Jill Christ is a naturopathic doctor, best-selling author, and an internationally recognized educator on neuroinflammatory conditions such as mold, Lyme, pan, pandas, and post-concussion syndromes. She's passionate about helping people recover their health after exposure to toxic mold. And she's the author of the book, Break the Mold, Five Tools to Conquer Mold and Take Back Your Health, and supports mold sick people through her mold canary membership. She also provides online training for medical practitioners wanting to become mold literate. Again, such an important piece because the, we need docs, right? Don't you always get the question? Cause I'm sure you have a busy clinic and maybe a, sometimes a wait list or who knows how that works, but uh, most of us are doing it and patients are like, where else can I go for resources and how can I get trained? So the more that we can reach even our colleagues with the information, the better. Um, mm -hmm. That's a lot of me talking. Now I want to hear from you and I want to hear kind of like, how did you get into this? Tell us your journey. Um, tell us a little bit about how you got into mold related illness, complex chronic conditions, all of these things. Um, tell us your story. Sure. Uh, so I went to naturopathic school, ended up setting up in Wisconsin, which is near where my family is. And um, I had twins at the tail end of medical school, which I don't recommend at the wow. timing, <laughs> but I do recommend twins. Um, and it turns out I had Lyme disease and I was pregnant with them. I didn't discover that until my kids were 11. Um, and I didn't discover it until I was at a Lyme conference going through my Lyme training and uh, heard Dr. Charles Ray Jones present. And it was the first time that I thought, I think my kids have Lyme. <laughs> and, you know, deal, so complex chronic illness has kind of been our story for a long time. They're 21 now. So we've been doing wow. this for 21 years. Um, I was told it's fibromyalgia, mm -hmm. you know, put, pick yourself up by your own bootstraps, that kind of thing. You know, everybody has aches and pains of everyday living. So that's my personal story. So I went to medical school and missed the whole thing. Didn't ever connect that here I was dealing with chronic Lyme, but I was doing well with it, which is such a 
optimistic story because of my diet and my exercise habits and my sleep habits and my spiritual practice and you know all of these things were keeping me held together and so i established in wisconsin which is um a, janesville is a gm town so we've got factories we've got paper processing plants we've got lead mines so i ended up becoming focused in environmental medicine from from naturopathic family practice to environmental medicine and then had these patients that weren't getting better when we detoxed them when we did the chelation and they ended up having lyme disease i discovered so i, I realized i'm in the third leading state for lyme disease in the country uh so, so wisconsin is third yeah. leading yeah yeah wow. so it bounces between third and fifth depending on the cases each year so then I realized, oh, this is Lyme disease and I don't really know enough about it. So I went and I got trained with iLabs. And when you apply the functional medicine, naturopathic medicine principles of find and treat the cause, now that we had identified the cause, we kind of cleared the metals, mm -hmm. you know, and now we're dealing with the Lyme thing. A lot of people just got better. And that's so elegant and beautiful. But there is this group of people that still weren't getting better. And in one of those patients homes, they found black mold in his home. And when I went to go do, I did home visits in those days because I, I wanted to learn. Mm -hmm. So I followed the inspector around, I followed the remediators around and they estimated it was about a 12 year history and exposure. And that's when I thought, wow, I don't think I really understand mold. I graduated with some education in environmental medicine as a naturopathic doctor, I'm very lucky that way. But, and I knew it as an allergy problem Mm -hmm. And I knew that some ca rare cases people can get sort of an MS looking picture. Mm -hmm. That's basically what I was trained. And so when I hit the research for this patient, I'm like, oh, this is why he has tinnitus. This is why he has anxiety. This is why he can't sleep. This is why his gut's a mess. This is why he sprains his ankle stepping off the curb. This is why he has pelvic pain, urinary frequency, you know, and it started to just ping, 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 put all these things together. And then I realized my chronic Lyme patients were actually mold patients. Yes. It, we went investigating and, you know, it's like, oh my gosh, mold, mold exposure history, mold exposure history, mold exposure history, or current in almost all of those cases. So that's when I really, you know, became the mold lady as you do. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you and I, the this was the coolest yeah. thing about. Like, um... I, yeah, I've heard you say, um, you didn't find mold, mold found you, you know, and that's kind of how that happened. So I became... I kind of had this protocol using naturopathic medicine and then my kids and I moved into a moldy house and didn't know it. And so that's the impetus for writing the book was that wow. we started, I started saying, well, you know, I've had a really big loss in my life. I was going into perimenopause. They were going into puberty. And so you excuse all these things Yes. On, and you pin it on other things. And the fact that it duped me and I had been working with it for 10 years, I was like, this is, this is insidious. And um, then the, the flood kind of revealed itself for us and I realized it was mold and I knew exactly what to do. And I had the people to call. I was so, so fortunate and I felt so privileged. And that really was, was the thing that made me feel like I need to write a book about this because mm -hmm. this is stuff everybody can do. Yes. None of this is rocket science. Yeah. Yeah. And bringing aware. So I love a couple of things I heard you say. Number one, these things like Lyme and mold, they're almost, first of all, we were in not only, you know, we're conventionally trained, naturopathic for you, um, allopathic for me, um, but we're not taught this stuff in our training. And then even in the functional integrative realm, even there, it's not taught to the level that you and I have gone to. And what we found is we came across either ourselves or situations or patients where we couldn't find the answer. Kind of like we started off talking about, we're like, what else, what else? we need to know more information to help people. So this deep dive into the complex chronic Lyme mold um, neuroinflammatory stuff, it's so rare to have a doc that really, really understands it. And so the other thing that you and I share is this passion. It, first of all, it kind of discovered us, right? Because we happened upon yeah. this. We felt like, okay, because we want to find answers for patients and ourselves and our family and, and those tough cases, we had to, right? Like I always said, I don't want to do Lyme. Someone else can do that. And I've, you've heard me say exactly. this before on these interviews, but then I was like, I have to, if I want to get people well, I have to understand this. Same with mold and mold for me, the similar way it happened to me. And I was actually in denial for several months because like, no, because this will mean I have to leave my work or home or something pretty big is going to have to happen. Right. 
and I was in denial, which is why I always have such grace with patients meeting them where they're at. And granted, they do have to get out of the moldy environment at some point or remediate. But I have a lot of compassion because I know myself, I kind of knew before I knew what was going on. And it was hard to get my mind around what it was going to take in my life, the changes, like all my medical school books for 20 years had to go and certain things. And it's all good. Like my health is worth everything. Same with yours, if you're listening, but those things are kind of hard. And now that we're in it, it's like, of course, but I remember those feelings of like, do I really want to go into this? This is like, we've chosen by accident or purpose, the most complex cases that we could have on the planet earth. Right. 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 Yeah. So and they're the people I love to work with the most. Me too. The people picking these charts that are four inches thick and like, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry for all those records. Is it too much? I'm like, no, I love complexity. Bring it on. The more the, and I actually, it sounds like you do too. I actually really enjoy the challenge. And not only that, but so many of these patients are traumatized. They've been to so many doctors and either they've said, oh, your labs are normal. It's all in your head. See a psychiatrist. I mean, crazy things, these poor patients. And I have such a depth of compassion because I know that there's real answers like you do. And I know that if I can't help them, at least I can start to guide them in the right direction. And there's a lot of people who've given up or given or taken away their hope, right? Yeah. Yeah, you bet. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I think that's what I align with the most with you is just the heart centeredness of oh, what you're bringing you. to the, to the table. Yeah, thank yeah. you. Same with you. <laughs> it goes right back to you. The other thing, again, it was, you know, your journey of like discovery, like, oh, well, this is starting as you went through your journey and then your home, then we have to discover, like, we have to become first healers to ourselves. And I love that you started talking about too, the emotional, the spiritual, that we, we're going to talk about some of the physical, the herbs and those things. But this, I found um, one of the most important things in these chronic complex um, diseases is actually addressing the mind and the mindset and the trauma and the relationships and all these pieces are part of it as well. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my goodness. As I was going through my own healing and then real healing, you yeah. know, like the yeah. deep healing, I realized I invited mold, yeah. you know, I, I had an energy of fear and involution and it was, it was sort of like, I signed up for it in yeah. a way. And I'm sure that I made that contract of like, I want to help people globally in whatever way that I'm most meant to do that. And, you know, my angels are like, okay, you know, <laughs> here you go. Yes. Oh, I totally yeah. understand because I've learned in my life, it's all experiential. And so I have to experience some of these things and then understand it at that deep level, because some of the understanding you and I have that's unique is that we've lived it. Right. And that makes a lot of, because there's little tiny things that you recognize, not from a textbook, which there is no great textbook out yet <laughs> or from a training, but actually from experience and understanding and recognizing um, so let's turn just a little, I want to come back to mold and Lyme and how they play, but let's talk pan and pandas. What is this, first of all, kind of define what it is and how I, I would say not only children, which is typical, but adults can have some of these symptoms. And then let's dive into what, how would you look at those patients and, and that? So let's dive into pan and pandas first. Yes, my goodness. Um, so I'm a mom of, of twins with pans. So that's um, been my in the trenches learning as the research is catching up and the protocols are catching up. And um, Dr. Charles Ray Jones, who was a mentor of mine, he really helped me understand that this is one of the conditions under an umbrella of infection induced autoimmune encephalopathy. So if you think about the, the idea that um, and, and pre COVID, nobody really got this. Yeah. And now I feel like that's going to be the other complex chronic disease that we're dealing with, you know, yeah. this chronic infection from COVID. And so that's infection induced autoimmune, meaning an infection started this to have your body attack itself. And the way or the location it's attacking is in the brain. So that's what the encephalitis and encephalopathy part is. So pandas and pans are just two, and they're actually sort of two separate diagnoses because the, the, um, criteria for diagnosing them is a little bit different. The suddenness is a little bit different. The age is a little bit different, but basically with pandas, it's tied pretty strictly to a strep infection. Mm -hmm. And then once that's turned on, once those autoantibodies are turned on, which are attacking the basal ganglia, the brain, the brainstem, our reptilian brain, mm -hmm. you know, our safety. Mm -hmm. um, once that's turned on, now those immune cells of the brain are primed so that any subsequent infection, even viral, can flare the condition. 
So it's got a wax and wane pattern, meaning a flare and a calm and a flare and a calm. And the hard thing for us doctors is that we don't know then, is the person getting better because my protocol is working or is it because it's a normal course of this mm -hmm. condition? And sometimes you don't know. Sometimes you have to kind of wait it out and see. And then you don't know if there's been a flare. Is this the natural progression of the illness or did they have a new infection or a new exposure? So it makes it kind of complicated to treat. The, the symptoms that are going along are pretty consistent with both, that there is what we're calling in medicine OCD, which people in the public hear that and they think repetitive hand washing, or you know, the movies that you've seen as someone open the door, close the door, open the door, close the door, open it. They have to do it five times before they can walk through the door. In a child, that's gonna look different. That's just compulsions. So I, it might be, look like a kid who just can't follow directions mm -hmm. because they're overriding their thought process with the compulsion is saying, if you put your shoes on and go to school, something bad will happen to us on the way to school. So they're, they're saying, I have to stay home. And so it seems like they're not listening. What they're really doing is trying to control this compulsion yeah. that makes them feel unsafe, which is just, it's just so sad to your heart to think about a little one having that experience internally. Um, also, ticks are quite common. Mm -hmm. You might see some sort of anxiety, depression, oppositional behavior. Um, it's just like the kid with a pandas. It's like they changed overnight. Yes. With pans, it can be very different. And I'm seeing in my own practice that it's usually kids who come into this situation with maybe a congenital Lyme. So they never really had a normal immune system. So their onset is going to be less rapid. Yeah. But both can also have handwriting deterioration, learning difficulties, um, food restriction or food avoidance. And the way that I see that is the, that's them naturally saying, this might have something infective in it. Mm -hmm. This is probably gonna increase my lipopolysaccharides as I know you've talked about, and that's gonna increase my brain inflammation. So I'm just not gonna eat. And so I think that, you know, if we really can start to look at what is the symptom telling us, and then we know how to help them out. I see also a lot of bedwetting Mm -hmm. um, abdominal pain yeah. and insomnia. That's a big one. Sleep problems with these kids. So yeah, it's just, I think of it as they came into the infection with an immune depletion of some sort and mold is very commonly the reason for that immune depletion. So you're framing it as, and this makes sense, basically some sort of immune weakness allowed this infection to get the upper hand and they yeah. probably have a genetic susceptibility to neuroinflammation or autoimmunity as well. Kind of like, the, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, and it, you gave some really good descriptions of how you might see that. And you mentioned um, in vitro transmission of infections. And let's talk just a little bit about that. Cause I don't know that people really understand or know, but there's been a lot of cases where I'm talking to a mother and we're talking through and we're realizing, oh gosh, she definitely has Lyme and co-infections. We test, we find it. And then she's like, my children also have symptoms. And some of them were, and I, and I, I have a suspicion in, in many of them, there is that transmission, especially, how would you differentiate? And again, sometimes we don't know for sure. Of course we can test the child, but um, is that common? How would we see that present? Um, and what's your thoughts on the transmission in utero? Yeah, so we don't have studies in humans, yeah. um, but we do have some studies in dogs and mm -hmm. they found that um, mothers who got Lyme disease and we'll just stick with Borrelia because that's the easier one. We know that um, Bartonella and Babesia can also cross the, the placental barrier. So we can assume that's probably the situation with these, but they're kind of different in how they infect the cells. So um, with the Lyme bacteria, when the mom got an active Lyme case pregnant, mm -hmm. most, but not all dogs got the Lyme as well. So I don't know if that's been that genetic variation in the pups who got them and the pups that didn't but the majority then of the offspring do actually get Lyme disease through the placental exposure. And that's again, what I've seen clinically and whether or not oh, often we do test as sometimes I'm not seeing the children. So I don't always, you know, depending on what the situation is, but I'm always not really surprised, but uh, especially if it's a really complex um, eating disorder or eating issues from birth, feeding issues, um, failure to thrive. There's a lot of things you can see in the children. Um, mm -hmm. So quick question, uh, what would you do if you had a woman either who was wanting to get pregnant or pregnant um, and you knew she had an active Borrelia, Bartonella or Babesia or all three, uh, would you do herbal treatments? Would you, what's kind of your thoughts on pregnancy or pre-pregnancy planning with Lyme yeah. disease? That is a great question. And again, I go with my training with Dr. Charles Ray Jones. He has total comfort treating 
pregnant moms with antibiotics. Mm -hmm. I did not as an antibiotic yeah. doctor coming into that training. I was just like, oh, I don't know about this. Is this is it's going to kill the baby's gut microbiome and that uh -huh. kind of thing. <laughs> but you know, when you have something that is as microbiome disrupting and high force as Lyme uh, or even co-infections now on top of that, sometimes you have to meet it with the same amount of force. And so I got very comfortable using antibiotics in some of those more tender situations because now as a mom living with kids who are given congenital Lyme, I can tell you, I would have much rather spent the first year repopulating the gut and working on gut healing than 21 years working on an autoimmune disease. Yeah. And so I really, I meet the patient where they're at. If they, they really drive the bus on this one, I try to talk with them about what the risk factors are. Yes, they're, you know, antibiotics are going to cause some gut problems um, and plants work perfectly well. You know, it's, it's, if there's true belief in the remedy that you're using and it's aligned with who you are and the way that you live your life and your belief system, um, if we can match those, then it, it works so much better. But I rarely give an antibiotic without also doing the plants. And I think that makes me very unique um, just because I've seen so many studies where it's reducing resistance. It's reducing some of the negative side effects of the antibiotics. Yeah. And I'm assuming like with pregnancy, the penicillins or the cephalosporins would be your safer alternatives. Um, yeah. It's, it's usually a combination. He will actually use amoxicillin as yeah. well. So, yeah. okay. Yeah. Good. That's and I love your perspective because so similar to me. Again, I was one of those that's like, I don't want to hurt the gut. I'm not doing antibiotics. And then you realize is um, not only do sometimes it work better, whether it's pregnancy or no, I'm just talking all over for Lyme. I, and I'm definitely like you. I feel like there's an absolutely appropriate place for these drugs and they really are game changers. And sometimes mm -hmm. um, what's your experience for me, the herbals I love, I use all the time. And I just like you, I love what you said, because I'm kind of checking in with the patient. We have these options. Mm -hmm. What feels best to you? I can use all of them. I would say my experience herbs tend to really suppress and control, but they don't always eradicate as well. But what, uh, what I would love, you're the expert with herbs as a naturopath. Have you felt like you've been able to really truly eradicate without medications? Uh, yeah, definitely. In some cases it takes heavier dosing than people are comfortable with. And even how I was trained. Um, but you know, when I came to this, the position of like, okay, I'm about to give this person three antibiotics, yeah. <laughs> you know, I, so, okay, we're about to do Doxy yep. and Zithromax yes. and pulsing tin tinnitazole. Yes. Or I could try going higher on my herbs and just see, and, you know, thankfully I had patients that were adamant against antibiotics. And so yeah. I was like, well, then it's game on, let's figure this out. And so I used much higher dosing with the, with the plant medicine tincture particularly because I feel like that has it the alcohol seems to disperse it better and that's oh, a, so that's a Chinese medicine here because all of a sudden I, I sometimes I go with the alcohol free because I think they'll tolerate it better but I agree I think the alcohol tinctures actually work better it's so yeah, great I think they kind of push and disperse um yeah. so yeah I was giving doses in the you know two teaspoons yeah. four to six times a day sort of dosing and yeah it does get better you know, this is great. You know, that's been the conundrum for me is the stuff I use at the doses I use, we, I feel like we can control it, but they're on the herbs. And once we mm -hmm. take them off, often they'll flare. Um, what are some of your favorites? I mean, I saw the John Hopkins study with Japanese knotweed and cryptolepis, some of the leaders. I do love those. Let's talk herbs and some of the yes. favorites. And the funny thing is that was in vitro. I still clinically find you still often need others and I don't find their end all be all, but you're the expert on herbs. Let's talk. What are your favorites for say Borrelia? Um, yeah. Just, so uh, Japanese knotweed. Yeah. yeah, definitely. Interestingly enough in, in the East coasters, mm -hmm. they tend to do very well with a little echinacea, which is very different than the Midwest. Borrelia. Yes. And um, I would have been concerned about that with just overstimulating, like say you had it all. Yeah. That makes sense. So, yeah. Yep. And then something berberine containing. So either, a, a, you know, a, usually I just use berberis and, um, or it could be organ grape root, something like that. I love Stefania for pain. A lot of the, that inflammatory joint stuff is somebody whose expression is really jointy. Um, also Japanese don't wait for that. Um, and then cat's claw is yes. lovely <laughs> and you can use it in tincture. You know, there's this whole thing about TOA free and they did it. I used whole plant cat's claw and, you know, and 
have done just fine with patients not having problems with it. And if you found Cascal also has a good antiviral activity, because I feel like it's a good, like with that, that good Epstein bar, you know, that layer of like an HHV6 and an Epstein yes. bar. Yeah. So it's olive leaf. That's sometimes you just yes, I love olive leaf. Yeah. <laughs> And I find olive leaf again this is my clinical experience, but it's what feels like the only one that people don't really hurt. Like it's such a supportive, nurturing herb that I don't know if I can remember anyone who's ever had a, a bad reaction. It's very just nurturing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's nice because it's antifungal. Yeah. So if you do have somebody that has been on antibiotics and they have this candida overgrowth or biofilm or something like that, that's when I'll kind of toss in that little bit of olive leaf or something that will help on a broad spectrum standpoint. Um, if there is mold in there as well, I use thyme. That's one of my favorite because it's ultra safe. It's broad spectrum. In the hospitals, they used to use thyme essential oil for fumigating rooms. Uh -huh. so I'm like, well, if that's worked in hospital based medicine. Yeah, why not, right? <laughs> yeah. Great. Yeah. And then dipsacus with I or teasel root, I'm very mm -hmm. careful with. I'll drop dose that and I put that in a separate bottle. Mm -hmm. They just drop it in water and then can sip off of it because that can really hurt a person. And that might be a Midwest thing. I know um, that it's one of them that I see for Rocky Mountain spotted fever. And I just saw that you were talking about that in your newsletter. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, you know, I'm careful because sometimes I think we might flare a Rocky Mountain spotted yeah. fever with that one. And then Smilax glabra or Sarsaparilla is a endotoxin binder. Oh, so that one is great for the person whose gut is a mess yeah. and they can't tolerate even a little sprinkle of mega spore, you know, like yeah. you're just trying to get them some spore biotic and they like sprinkles and they have a herbs from that, then I'll add the, the Smilax. Oh gosh. Yeah. So helpful. those are some of my favorites. That's tremendous. What about like in that John Hopkins study, Cryptolepis, my experience is that one's really harsh. You have to be kind of very careful, but any experience with that one? Do you feel like it has a place? Is it on the higher spectrum of aggressiveness or, or anything in particular on cryptolepis? Mm -hmm. I start with artemisia when it's a Babesia combination. Yeah. Yeah. Um, then if that's not kicking it or because that does sort of, we get liver tolerance to mm -hmm. that. So that one is one you kind of pulse in oh. and take out and pulse in and take out. You can, you know, pulse for a good two weeks, but um, if that's not kicking it, then I will add the cryptolepis. And then for Bartonella, Houtinia is yes. lovely. My favorite. We used to call that hoity toity in the office because no oh. one. <laughs> no, yeah, but we I totally love that one. Yes. Everybody says it differently in our office. But <laughs> yeah, that's ours. In Milk Thistle, everybody's like, ooh, she needs a silly bum. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Oh, oh this. Yeah. Tremendous. Okay, so we talked about a little bit what is P and P and just overview back here, lime and herbs. Um, let's go back to like so say you suspect P and pandas, neuroinflammation of some sort. How would you look at how would you work out that patient? Do you do neuroauto antibodies or do you do clinical diagnosis or how would you look at the patient who comes in with whether it's a child or an adult with neuroinflammation? Yeah, so for pandas and pans, those are still both considered clinical diagnoses, just like Lyme disease, even though we love, we really like having labs for Lyme, you know, but it's still really truly is still an okay to have it be a clinical diagnosis. Um, because of that immune deficiency antecedent state, I do like to do an IGAM, so an IgG, A, M, and E, subclasses of G, subclasses of A, just to see if we're going to do any infection labs. Now I have an idea of if we will need to sort of augment the results because they could be muted if the person, if the child's in a low IgG subclass. And we typically see two and four is what I'm seeing in practice. IgG subclass three, I'm pretty much thinking they have a mold exposure if mm -hmm. that's low because that has, or a candida overgrowth because mm -hmm. that has that disulfide bond like um, the gliotoxin does. So that's super informative. And that tells me if that's the kid who's going to be typically, if they're, if I see that I need to be supporting their IG in some way, shape or form, or they're not gonna, they're going to be susceptible to infection and flares. Um, so that would be number one. And then a good old CBC, you yeah. know, we can tell a lot from a really inexpensive CBC. A lot of them have their white count is just edging on low or low. Yeah. My functional level for white count is 5.0 to 7.0. That's the, that's the sweet deal. I totally healthy, agree. healthy, total, yeah. you know, and so that's what I'm so lucky. I was trained in that functional stuff way before we changed numbers. Right. Cause then they keep changing our numbers. I'm like, I, same thing. And I love that you said that. Cause that's one of those flags where people all the time, Oh, my doc said, I've had that for 20 years, the white count of three. Right. And you're like, uh, but wait, there's something. Uh, 
right? Yeah. There's some, there's a big deal there. I love that you mentioned that. Yeah. If you're listening, your doc said your white blood count is low, but it's normal. Find someone to help you figure that out because there's usually an underlying cause. Absolutely. And then platelets, if platelets are low, then I think about mold as well, because that combination, you know, mold is one of the few things that can cause low platelets. So again, you hear that a lot of, they're like, my doctor said it's okay though. You know, so it's like, you can tell a lot from the CDC and the chem panel. That's why we run them. (laughs) Yeah. And some of the, some of the things that there can be inborn errors in metabolism that are not pandas and pans Mm -hmm. that you can rule out. Um, And there can be other things like, so that would be things like copper and um, creatinine clearance and things like that, that are, are totally not related to pandas and pans, but have a very similar picture and as well, B12 deficiency. Yes. A lot of kids have B12 mm-hmm. deficiency because their guts from pesticides and glyphosate, yeah. they're not able to take it in anymore. And so that now we get that deficiency and it can look a lot like the neural picture yes. of pandas and pans. Yeah. And so, I don't know and how then, reference ranges for you, but I've, uh, if it's below 500, I'm thinking there's an issue. Is yeah. there's- and support it, you know, and it tastes good. Like a sublingual yeah. B twelve. What kid is not? I know, right? There's <laughs> lots of cherry flavor there. Yeah, yeah. They're like, oh, do I get my, you know, cherry candy? Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then a natural killer cell total and func- um, function. Uh-huh. That's kind of expensive if, if someone doesn't have insurance coverage. So the natural killer cell function. I'm, I'm only running that if I think that I'm not sure. You know, if I've run the IgGs and, or the IgM, then then I might add that natural killer cell, especially if we, there's a known mold exposure. Mm-hmm. That tells me then if that kid is going to be able to respond to I, IVIG therapy or not. Yeah. And what do we need to be doing to boost that natural killer cell count? And there's simple, easy things like thymus gland, yeah. like the um, the SBI protect from ortho orthomolecular. That's giving actual IgG, and people say, well, that can't work because your stomach acid will denature it and it's well i've seen it bring up numbers me too i always used to say it's a close to ivig so just for people who don't know ivig is it, it intravenously immunoglobulin is from plasma donors like thousands of donors for the patient who has a severe immune deficiency and low total igd it's a game changer like it can turn around but it's very expensive like we're talking eight to fifteen thousand per infusion and of course usually what we do is we get insurance coverage but as you can imagine, it's expensive, it's time consuming, it, it, it can be hard to titrate and tolerate. So it's amazing. But what Dr. Kristen and I are talking about is oral bovine immunoglobulins, which is like um, colostrum, like new milk. Mm-hmm. Um, and it contains all those immunoglobulins. And I agree with you when I don't have the option of IVIG or I just need a little extra support. Um, and the studies show that these immunoglobulins orally bind passive binding of viruses, H pylori, lipopolysaccharides, which is- I did not know that. Yeah, like it's amazing. That's why I love to learn from you. Oh, it's mutual. (laughs) (laughs) Um, So yeah, the studies, H pylori and viruses, even the coronavirus, not necessarily COVID, but the whole family, there's studies that show that it passively binds. So when I have someone who has COVID actively having gut symptoms, I immediately put them on a spore probiotic and bovine immune globulins, and they do a lot better. That's a great tip. Interesting, interesting. Yeah. So I love that you yeah, mentioned fun. that immune system and I kind of interrupted you on labs. Do you natural killer cells, blood counts? Yeah. Is there anything else that you wanted to mention? Yeah. So- Vitamin D. I mean, and that's, that's kind of what we should be checking that on everybody, but specifically people with immune issues. I do a 25 OH and then a 125. Those are two different for people listening. who don't know that the, the 125 can be a really good marker for brain glutathione status. Wow. That's sort of my cheap and easy get insurance coverage test to get that done because I've seen so commonly then that those are the people that respond better from glutathione supplementation and really oh, need this it. This is fantastic. Because on a different person, this is great because what I'm thinking of, I've, I've heard some of the lectures on intracellular infections like um, mycoplasma and atypicals and then aspergillus. So if I see that conversion, that's going really high. So if you're listening, what we're talking about is the regular vitamin D that most doctors check is 25 hydroxy. And we want that to be, my ranges are like 50 to 80, maybe even a little higher. 50 to 90 for me. Yeah. 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 So real similar. And then, but that conversion, that 125 hydroxy calcitria is active D and you don't want that super high, but if you see that really high, especially when their D is low, they're converting to that active form. And there's a reason. So Mm -hmm. you're talking about brain glutathione status. I'm all, I'm, I'm seeing um, intracellular infections. So to me, it's a clue. There's something creating this inflammatory 
process and I'm looking for infections, the common ones are mycoplasma, chlamydia, pneumonia, and uh, aspergillus or some sort of a mold or yeast issue. Um, and the glutathione, that would make sense because they're probably depleted in glutathione if any of those infections are present. Exactly. Yeah. How interesting. It is. It's like, this is great. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the thought was, um, oh, so MMP9 can also be blood brain barrier with mold That's a whole nother issue. But when you mentioned blood brain barrier and glutathione, the higher the MMP9 can, can often be associated with more leaky brain. If we put it in layman's terms, would you say that's kind of how you view mm -hmm. that? Any other thoughts on, on MMP9? Yeah. And actually our colleagues, Dr. Raj Patel and mm -hmm. Dr. Talia Hale have, have, they just presented at ILADS maybe last year, I think it was in person. So whenever we could do that, yeah. the last in-person one um, presented, Dr. Hale presented that they are seeing a correlation between MMP9 and histamine intolerance and onset of mast cell activation. Oh, and wow. I just think that's, that's, then it makes it such an easy way to test histamine. Yeah. You don't have to be doing Mayo right. Clinic, send the sample on deep freeze, you know, all that kind of stuff. You don't have to deal with any of that. Yeah, because how many times that. you trip taste or histamine and you get negatives because you're not in the midst of, so those are just for your yeah. listening. Those are markers for MCAS, but often, unless we catch someone in the midst of a flare, their trip taste is normal, their histamine is normal. So MMP9, this is, and it makes perfect sense because histamine creates totally. permeability. So it yeah. grows right along with blood brain barrier permeability issues too. Yeah. Isn't that interesting? I love it. It's like all, all for a circle. Do you ever do a Cunningham panel or any of the autoimmune neuro? I mean, those are expensive. Again, I like, like you, I try to do the cheapest, easiest things to start. Um, mm -hmm. Do you, do you like doing that? Do you feel like you need it to come? You maybe don't even need it to confirm, but do you use that very much or anything else in that realm? Cyrex? Well, just like, just like in the mold world, because I have identical twins. I do a lot of split sample testing comparing ah, the two love of them. It. I just can't help it. Yeah. <laughs> My kids tease me that I'm Hitler. <laughs> I'm, like, <laughs> I'm like, hey, I just, I'm just running lab tests. But yeah, so the what I learned is that I have my sicker twin. Mm -hmm. That's when I learned how to do the IGAM first. Yeah. He had more severe IgG subclass deficiency and he had a more normal looking Cunningham panel. Ah. A healthier kid. And it makes sense when we think about this from yeah. as a vitality thing. My more healthy kid was a positive Cunningham, full on. And that was when we could, it was first available commercially. So I don't, I think they've changed numbers now. Mm -hmm. um, and his IgG subclass was normal. Wow. And I just thought, you know, so then I, contacted Dr. Cleary in University of Minnesota, who is doing studying on ASO, so anti-streptolysin O, which is one of the things that uh, a PANDAS panel might include. Um, so also pneumonia titers, they're kind of anti-DNAC, ASO, those are the all when we get into the PANDAS specific things, uh -huh. um, not just the immune assessment right. things. He found that there, there's a high prevalence of seronegative I ASO with PANDAS and PANS kids. Yeah. And so I think that that's, again, that kind of confirmed my thing of like, ooh, before we're running any of these other tests, we better make sure we know the immunoglobulin status of this mm -hmm. child, or we're going to be thinking things are negative and they're not. And so that research is really fundamental for, for my understanding of it's, it really does still need to be a clinical diagnosis because that Cunningham panel, while they have adjusted yeah. the numbers, I think it's still, you know, it could still be tricky as with anything, you know, as with Lyme, Lyme labs or even a strep or, you know, any normal yeah. antibody or a mono test or something like that. Like we could be seeing muted numbers. So I love, because again, that's something I do on every patient, immunoglobulins, total subclasses, not a lot of docs are consistently doing that, but I find it core, which we're going to talk about next immune system. Cause that's one of the core things here and everything we're talking about, but that makes so much sense. So if you're listening to your doctor, if you're a patient, ask your doctor for these tests, really important to check total IgG, total IgM, total IgE and total IgA. IgA is your mucosal immunity. So your sinuses, your mucosal surfaces, your lungs. And there's a lot of people with deficiencies there and they're gonna have more proneness to candida in the gut, chronic sinusitis, anything on the mucosal surface, they're gonna have more difficulty kind of eradicating those bugs. They're probably gonna have more trouble with biofilms. And there's something called selective IgA deficiency, which can be diagnosed by a low serum IgA and is a 
clinically significant immunodeficiency, there's a high correlation with celiac disease in that. So you, you know, have your doctor check for celiac or gluten sensitivity, if that's low. Um, IgM is less common, but that's one of the immunoglobulins that's also important. And that actually defines an immunodeficiency as well. IgG is the one we're mostly talking about, the most common one. And there's a new study. I don't know if you've seen this. I think it was just a few months ago that they're, they're actually classifying IgE deficiency in and of itself, which we've never, that's more of a histamine response, yeah, but it's usually high, yeah. right. But if it's low, it actually qualifies as a new diagnosis. It's a different type of course. And I've just been finding a few of those with zero IgE. And uh, that also qualifies in the realm of immunodeficiency, even though it's kind of a different arm of the immune system. Interesting. Yeah. I had not seen that. That's really interesting. I'm glad. And I, it's amazing. It, it really speaks to our environmental yes. impacts, doesn't it? You know, that we're just getting more and more immunoglobulins getting knocked down. Yes. Well, and let's go transition in the last 10 minutes or so immune system, because I think we think very much alike. I'm always telling patients, I think if we tested 10,000 people on the street for Lyme disease, we'd find a lot of people have Lyme and they don't even know it but they're walking around, they're asymptomatic, they're fine, right? Mm -hmm. And this is important for patients to not feel like victims because they get this diagnosis of Borrelia, Lyme disease, or any co-infection. And sometimes they're like, oh my gosh, I read this book or I saw a Facebook group and am I gonna die? Or, you know, they go to the worst case scenario. Mm -hmm. And I always wanna frame it. And again, I wanna hear your perspective in a second here. Um, in the fact of what it means is if, it, if it's presenting with symptoms, our body should be able to keep some of these old viral and infections under control. So what it usually means is there's a weakness in the immune system that's allowing that to pop up. And our job as clinicians is yes, we treat the infection, the load, but part of it, the majority is actually, how do we support your immune system? Because you should be able to walk around with old infections and not have them all take you down. Thoughts on that, your approach, because immune system so core, right? Yeah, hundred percent agree. Yeah, immune system is so core. It's so important. And, and that resilience, you know, it comes down to when we're talking about trauma and adverse childhood events, it's so neat that the, that conversation is moving into resilience. You know, it's not like that everybody doesn't have trauma when you're growing up. Right. It's about how resilient are you? Same thing with infections. And that's one of the things I remember so shocking in the early days of my Lyme training that they said, well, you never get rid of Lyme. Yeah. I was like what? Really? Once you have it, you have it in your body. And I'm that can't be right. You know, there's people that I've treated, you know, cured and, and yeah, if you were to take tissue biopsies and stuff like that, and, and that's from Dr. Alan McDonald's research of finding it in the brain, finding it in different places in the body that just floored me. That's when I realized, wow, okay, it, this is really about patient education and yeah. building that resilience and trusting your body. I yeah. see that with mold a lot, that it took a mold exposure for someone to say, now I know it's okay to be the inconvenient one in the, at the restaurant or at the hotel and ask you for another room. It's okay to be doing that where before they might've thought, oh, I don't think I feel very good in here. And they would have stayed. And so it's all those. That's my things. story. I had to yeah. learn to so get it. Cause it was like compliant and, and easy to get along with and not making waves. And, you know, one of the things that I don't know where I was told this probably a therapist at one time, but I actually write it for patients all the time. Be kind to yourself. Like literally I write them a prescription because so many of our patients are empaths, they're givers, they're nurturers like you and I, they're, they're healers even. And that nature is beautiful. They're people who are giving to their family, their friends, their children, their parents, everybody in the world gets their love and compassion except themselves. Right. Mm -hmm. And to teach that. And again, I had to kind of learn that like the, it's actually being kind to yourself when you say, no, I'm sorry, I can't eat that. Or no, I'm sorry, this room doesn't fit for me. I need to. So that is so important in the teaching to heal people is it's okay to love yourself enough to take care of yourself and to be kind to yourself. Beautiful. Yes, absolutely. And it's hard when you're a kind person. You feel like you're putting people out or, you know, it's a whole right. new, it's a whole new thing to learn way to way yeah. being in the world. Mm -hmm. It really is. Um, <laughs> gosh, this is so much fun. What, um, what last bits have we not covered or would you say are super important to people listening if they have been diagnosed with Lyme or they have a child or a loved one with pan or pandas, which is becoming more and more common or, you know, the complex chronic, a lot of people are really suffering now, or even post COVID, maybe you're out there and you're like, I haven't been the same four months ago when I got COVID and I'm still trying to recover. Um, what can you leave them with as far as hope or um, insight or any last bits of advice? 
advice. <laughs> yeah. Well, there's one thing that I've kind of stumbled on, you know, in the mold world, in the shoemaker training is VIP spray is, is you know, game changer for people, regulates that hypothalamus pituitary adrenal axis. But a lot of my patients didn't tolerate that. When I kind of learned the shoemaker protocol, I was like, oh, I'm missing this whole thing. And so reformulating things, I've, I've reformulated vasopressin into homeopathic. Uh -huh. um, so it's like an ultra small dose yeah. and it trains the brain to start making it again. And I've done this with VIP as well. And so I, I feel like, and it's, there it is, it's a game changer for people and they can tolerate it. And you don't have to wait till all their infections are gone and yeah. blah, 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 all that kind of stuff. So I think just my message of hope is if something that you are working with your doctor on isn't working, if you're a complex chronic illness or sensitive person, try an ultra, ultra, ultra small amount of that. Like I was referring to the spore biotic, you know, sprinkles. And yeah. because it, it may be that you are so receptive, which is a gift yes, that you are so receptive and willing for healing. You're open, all the channels are open. It only takes a micro dose to make a difference. So sometimes that we talked about Lyme, I'm using, you know, big doses of tincture, yeah. but you know, sometimes it's just like a drop of a Byron White formula and that's all that they need. And their body is in a state of receptivity. So don't see that as a, don't feel cursed yeah. or um, beat yourself up or those kind of things. Like that is actually a sign that you are very receptive for healing and ripe for change and finding your health again. Oh, I love that you ended with that. That's kind of my story. I remember when I first got mold issues and I was like, oh, I'm going to kill this. And I was all in the, I'm going to just, you know, take care of this. And I, I, people have heard me say this before, but I was like, I don't know how many binders I took, but I like loaded up the binders for two months. I had hives from my neck down. My whole body was covered like three plus pitting edema. I was a wreck. I mean, I was going way too fast for my sensitive soul, which I had to admit that I was. <laughs> Don't you hate that? Like the I do. I'm, it, like, I'm a sensitive flower. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but what I've learned is exactly what you said is all of a sudden now, like homeopathic doses or gentle things, I do so well with these things. And they're just tiny little drops of this or that, or small doses or intermittent, you know, pulse dosing. And now that I've accepted that I am sensitive, it's actually this kindness to ourselves back to the original story there when we yeah. do that. So again, if you're listening and you're like being blown out of the water, um, work with your doc or, or just try things in a lower dose, because sometimes you'll get a really great response at a lower dose. And it's kind of counterintuitive. Yeah. Oh, I just got chills. So that's so true. So yeah. you that listening, we just hit something there. I can We tell. did. I know because again, and I'll tell you guys are the worst. I don't mean to stereotype, but the men are like, give it to me. Give me a plan. Give me a protocol. I just want to beat this. You know, the, and again, not to stereotype because I'm sure there's some women out there and there's some men that aren't like this, but in general, they're like, they want to go and get at it. And sometimes I'm like, it's actually better if you go more slowly. <laughs> so, right. right. Yeah. Now we don't have to pick your kidneys up. after Exactly. All this. <laughs> your adrenals are like totally yeah. dry. Right. Oh, this is so much fun. So where can people find you? Where can they get your book? I'll be sure to inc include links, but I want to have it on here as well. So tell yeah, us. Yeah, thank you. More. Yeah. So my website is drkrista.com. That's D-R-C-R-I-S-T-A.com. You can get my book on Amazon at Barnes and Nobles or wherever you get your books. You can get it from my website. Um, my training course for practitioners, if you're a practitioner listening, that's on my courses tab. And if you are a person that's suffering from complex chronic illness, you can um, check out my membership on the membership tab. And it's super fun. Like we have these open Zoom rooms where people can share with each other and the members are, um, man, we've attracted like the neatest people and they're all there to help each other. Yeah, it's great. That is so great because that's one of the biggest things in healing is realizing you're not alone. So again, if you're out there feeling alone, love it. I would highly recommend. Um, yeah. Well, thank you for your time today. This has been, I knew it'd be a treat and it was, um, and so appreciate your advice and insight. Thank you. I appreciate the invitation. I can't wait till we chat again. Sounds good.